One of the most acclaimed Soviet animators was director Yuri Norstein. He has a small body of work that left a huge impact on the world of animation with his technical and thematic experimentation. With his wife Francesca Yarbusova, they created a device using multiple layers of glass to create groundbreaking three-dimensional effects to enhance their distinctive style of cutout animation. They made poetic, lyrical works that were mainly about animals on the surface, but had allegorical resonance. Norstein often highlighted his home country's culture by utilizing Russian folktales, history, and composers. The pair are known for their meticulous perfectionism and taking an extremely long time to produce even a small amount of footage. Many of Norstein's shorts are mixed media, combining live action footage with animation. The stories are usually told visually, sometimes with minimal or no dialogue. Norstein's 1968 debut, The 25th, The First Day, uses pre-existing Soviet art from the 1920s to tell the story of the October Revolution for its 60th anniversary. The art gives the short a cubist feel and also resembles constructivist art, a movement that gained popularity in the USSR during the 1920s. Various Russians are included, most notably the modernist Mark Chagall, and the soundtrack features the iconic Russian composer Dmitry Shostakovich. The short contains no traditional dialogue, just text on screen and a recording of a Lenin speech. It's a mixed-media work that uses real footage, ending with clips of Soviet crowds. Unlike much of the popular animation of the time, Norstein avoids using a bright color palette. Much of it is monochrome, and the main colors are red and gray. Like much of Norstein's early work, it feels much different from the films that made him famous, but it does feature the cutout animation that would define his career. Norstein's second short was Seasons, based on a series of piano pieces with the same name by Tchaikovsky. It was co-directed by one of the most influential early Soviet animators, Ivan Ivanov Fano. Seasons is about a couple in love and how they are affected by the four seasons, and again the story is told with no dialogue. The nine-minute short uses puppets, and this was his only puppet film as director. Norstein's attention to detail is on display here with some incredibly intricate backgrounds. Norstein's least essential effort is Children in Matches, a four-minute fire safety PSA meant to show the dangers of children playing with fire. Again, this has no dialogue and the characters speak using sound effects. In 1971, Norstein again collaborated with Ivan Ivanov Fano on the Battle of Kerzhenets, inspired by a legend about a lost Russian city and a real medieval war that took place when the Mongols invaded Kievan Rus. It makes use of medieval Russian fresco paintings, resulting in a highly unique look. The short is quite two-dimensional looking, with little sense of depth and limited, often stiff motion. Norstein again includes music by a famous 19th century Russian composer, this time going with Nikolai Rimsky-Korsakov. This was the first film made after his marriage to Francesca Yarbusova, who helped design this film and would go on to become an indispensable and basically equal partner to Norstein. The Battle of Kerzhenets was a turning point in his style, and his later films had a much different look. This was the first of Norstein's shorts to receive attention outside the Soviet bloc and won some international awards. This was also the final film of Norstein's that had no dialogue or narration whatsoever. The first short film that Norstein directed on his own, besides the PSA, was The Fox and the Hare, which is also the first of his animal-themed films. It features a simple plot of a fox that tries to steal a rabbit's home when the fox's house made of ice melts in the springtime. The short is based on a Russian folktale and features a narrator that describes it like a bedtime story. The narrator speaks for the animals, so we don't hear their actual voices. Also, some shots have designs on the edges that bring to mind the frames on a children's picture book. This starts to show the style that would eventually become their trademark, but it's not quite fully formed. The Fox and the Hare is one of their more lighthearted works, and lacks the melancholy feeling of their later films. This story is also much more straightforward than Norstein's famous shorts. In 1974, Norstein and Yarbusova made The Heron and the Crane, another adaptation of a Russian folktale with talking animals. This was the first time they used their distinctive device that involved placing the cutouts on several different layers of glass that could each be moved independently on all three axes, creating a unique sense of depth. The couple would produce all of their subsequent animation using this device. As a result, this short is indicative of their fully formed style. This film continues with the muted color palette, 
And Norstein justified his lack of bright colors by saying, quote, I don't want the colors to blind the eye of the viewer. The Heron and the Crane is another example of mixed media as it combines footage of real fireworks with the animation. This was the first Norstein film with a strong sense of melancholy, with a story about two birds that alternate between one courting the other and being rejected over and over. Neither can put aside their pride and the cycle just continues, with no resolution or happy ending. The message here is clear, and the short is warning us against the dangers of excessive pride. The popularity of Norstein's work reached its highest point in 1977 with Hedgehog and Fog. It was loved by Soviet audiences and won tons of awards. In the decades since, it has often been cited internationally as one of the best animated shorts ever made, and even earned the number one spot in a 2003 Japanese poll of animators. It was Norstein and Yarbusova's third film in a row about animals, and utilized their usual cutout style. However, this short was the most technically proficient display of their style yet, with their perfectionism most noticeable in the extremely realistic fog effects. Norstein combined the cutout animation with live action using footage of real water. The editing is quite interesting as some scenes use very fast cutting to effectively portray the hedgehog's disorientation and fear. The film tells a simple story about a hedgehog getting lost on the way to meet up with his friend, but has deep themes. These themes are ambiguous and open to interpretation, with popular interpretations ranging from psychological to mythological. Some story elements are unclear, such as where the voice came from the hedgehog hears on the river. The hedgehog sees a beautiful white horse in the fog, and what this animal symbolizes has been the subject of debate. The short has become iconic, appearing on Soviet stamps, being made into toys, and getting mentioned in the 2014 Winter Olympics opening ceremony. The couple's follow-up, Tale of Tales, was their longest yet at 28 minutes. Despite being more abstract than works like Hedgehog in the Fog, it was quite popular and also regarded as one of the best animated films of all time. The enigmatic film is about post-World War II Soviet society, and although it is about humans, it's seen through the eyes of a sad little wolf. Much of the film is ambiguous, but some aspects are more clear as to what they mean. For example, the haunting dancing sequence where women are left without their male partners is a representation of the mass casualties the USSR suffered during World War II. Other parts are more surreal, like the bull jumping rope with the young girl. The story is episodic, and the connection between the various vignettes is certainly not obvious to the viewer. Tale of Tales was almost banned due to its ambiguity, and was only allowed to have a very limited release at first. Tale of Tales is non-linear, and doesn't tell a straightforward story, instead attempting to imitate the way we remember things. While dealing with Russian history, it's also a very personal film, as it is autobiographical, and the house is inspired by the childhood homes of both Norstein and Yarbusova. Like Hedgehog in the Fog, Tale of Tales uses real elements such as actual fire. Various styles are used, and parts are entirely monochrome. Also, music is key to the film as the soundtrack features classical music from artists like Bach and Mozart, while the little gray wolf at the center of the story comes from a Russian lullaby. In fact, the wolf singing the lullaby is the only thing resembling spoken dialogue in the film, as the story is told mostly visually. Sound effects play a crucial role as well, like when the record player stops during the dance scene, indicating the loss of life due to war. In the decades since, Norstein and Yarbusova have released only a tiny bit of completed work, Besides a two-minute part of a Japanese anthology film and a segment of a children's TV show, they've been spending the last 40 or so years working on The Overcoat, an adaptation of a Nikolai Gogol short story from the 19th century. At first, it was being produced by Soyuz Mult Film, but they were fired after only producing 10 minutes in the first six years. Since then, they've started working on it independently and refused all offers of outside funding. Only some small clips have been released, and it is very possible it will never be finished. The Overcoat now has the longest production of any animated film in history, beating out similar long gestating animation such as Richard Williams' Thief and the Cobbler and Marcel Yankovic's Tragedy of Man. Despite the fact that Norstein and Yarbusova's entire filmography runs less than two hours, they've left a massive influence on the world of animation. The most notable example is legendary anime director Hayao Miyazaki, who even cited Hitchhog in the Fog as one of his favorites. The Studio Ghibli Museum in Japan even hosted an exhibition of Norstein's films in the 2000s. Wallace and Gromit creator Nick Park is also a fan, and he even offered to help fund the overcoat. 
Luckily, almost all of Norstein's films are available for free on YouTube, but sadly they have not been released in HD. Perhaps if awareness of his work is increased, they can get the high quality presentation they deserve. That's all for this video. Thanks for watching and please don't forget to subscribe. If there are any other animators you'd like to see me do a video on, let me know in the comments.